Hey everybody, John the Other here, obviously. And I have a question. My question is, why do women want to own Hillary Clinton? Now I want to be very clear in what I'm asking here. Why is it that in the female public narrative, Hillary Clinton represents all women? How is it that women, and women journalists, and women bloggers, and women commentators, and women YouTubers, and even the absolute kick-ass Canadian lawyer Marie Hennon, who is a woman, all of them refuse to accept Hillary as an individual person, and instead they flatly insist that she is the embodiment of all women. Why? Of course, my question is not just about why women seem unable to accept the fact that one particular politician is a person separate from all others and who happens to, by coincidence, be of the same sex as them. My question is also, why would women, or anybody, want and demand somebody as vile as Hillary to be their avatar? Let's just set aside her sex. Let's give her no sexual or gender identity and just look at who and what she is. Well, she's the establishment. Hillary is the politician in bed with the banking class whose bad debts in 2008 were transferred to you and your children and your grandchildren. Hillary is the ultimate Washington establishment insider. Hillary is one of the heads of a billion dollar money laundering schemes to bypass federal law preventing foreign governments from having pay to play access to your government. Hillary is the most openly criminal and corrupt politician in modern American history. She lacked any charisma. She is the candidate who the repeatedly busted for lying mainstream media preferred to kiss up to. Isn't that indictment? She may have even caused the disappearance of or the murder of as many as 30 of her own staff in the last 30 years. Hillary is the Secretary of State whose complete bland indifference and disinterest in the well-being of her own consulate staff resulted in their deaths. Hillary is embroiled in a series of criminal scandals which persist not because she's a woman but because she is a criminal whose scope of corruption and criminality make the conduct of fictional mobsters like Scorsese Mafia look like they are amateur toddlers. And she is a candidate whose campaign focused almost exclusively on personal attack and pandered shamefully to victim and identity politics largely failing to address issues of policy. She is also the candidate who hijacked her own party's nomination process, booting out a better choice in the person of Bernie Sanders, a better choice who would have won in the election against Donald Trump. So why do women want to own this creature? Why are they continuing to say that Hillary is them? That she is all women? Why are women not alarmed and repulsed at the concept that this political criminal is their spiritual avatar? The absence, the complete absence in the female public narrative of acknowledgement of this individual's criminality and corruption suggests one of several answers. The first one is women as a group cannot see or they are unable to see corruption no matter how blatant and pervasive that corruption and criminality is. Now, this is a pretty bleak possibility because it suggests that women have no moral compass other than what benefits them as good and what doesn't benefit them as bad by their own metric. This possibility would imply, if it was true, that Womanness, the the state of being a woman, is actually a sexualized form of sociopathy. This possibility is something I find, honestly, pretty unpalatable. The second possibility might be that women are neither sociopaths nor zombies nor malevolent, but are infants, sort of moral toddlers who have never developed the social capacity for recognition of other people as people. However, rather than exploring that, I'm just going to dismiss it because I am asking my question in response to the fully adult, the highly capable, and the supremely talented Canadian lawyer, Marie Hennon. Hennon is 
recently famous for her successful defense of the fraudulently accused Canadian broadcaster John Gameshi. Hunan is not an infant. She does not suffer from arrested adolescence or childhood of the mind, and it is her article in Canada's Globe and Mail that I am responding to here. I'll put a link to that in the low bar. The title is, Thank You, Hillary, Now Women Know That Retreat Is Not An Option. Now, that's the title. Ordinarily, editors and not writers are the people who choose the title of an article, but Hennon is not a staff writer at the Globe and Mail. She's a guest submitting an opinion piece, and it's likely, I think, that this is her choice of a title. And by that title, Hillary was not the Democratic Party candidate. She was not the establishment candidate. She was not the candidate of globalization and bankers. She was not the media's preferred candidate. She was the woman party candidate. And her success or failure was all about vagina and ovaries, and her supporters and her detractors were similarly chiefly concerned only with vaginas and ovaries. And in this conception, Hillary doesn't get to be a distinct person. Her detractors don't get to have opinions other than whether or not vagina candidate is good or bad. Now, if this is Heinen's position, I see no reason to not throw this assumption squarely into the rubbish bin where it belongs with no apology. But of course, the editor at the Globe and Mail may have chosen that title rather than Marie Heinen. The article proper begins with the following assertion. And I'll read it to you. Going high when they go low means you speak only to people who are listening in the first place. It's like bringing thank you cards to a knife fight. You're going to get hurt or lose. But, of course, going high when they go low does not mean speaking only to people who are listening. It means avoiding dishonest and unethical tactics, even if your opponent is using dishonest and unethical tactics. It was... Hillary, who uttered these words near the beginning of the second presidential debate, minutes before attempting to slander her opponent by claiming he endorsed or regularly committed sexual assault. And, honestly, that's pretty low. What's lower is the repetition of the same question after Trump responded to it two more times, and the joining in on this ambush by the supposed neutral moderators of the debate. Of course, in the 11-year-old video showing... Trump's brash, grab-them-by-the-pussy comments, that video shows Trump not actually grabbing anyone, and aside from the Hollywood obligatory kiss on the cheek, he kept a professional distance from the theatrically sexy woman who clearly reveled in her role as an, an object of desire. Indeed, the mainstream description of Trump's on the bus comment about you are a pussy, he said to his uh, colleague there, responding to the guy goading him to trying to give get him to give the uncouth thumbs up gesture, you know, approving of the scant attire of their female host, Donald did not actually say you are a pussy. What he said is you are a piece of work. And yes, I have listened to that piece of audio many times to determine what it was he actually said. It wasn't you are a pussy, it was you are a piece of work. Marie Hennon argues with people in Canadian courtrooms for a living, doing so with an extreme level of skill. Her opening of an opinion editorial with the claim of going high by Clinton, where slander was Clinton's opening gambit, is farcical. It's farcical. Now she says next, Donald Trump isn't the first demagogue to be carried to power, and carried he was. Well, here we have a completely true statement. Trump is a demagogue. He's a rabble-rouser, and of course, if that was all he was, his election would be a very sad day indeed. But Trump's rise to the position of president-elect is a lot more than a populist firebrand. He is the popular repudiation of a decades-long top-down culture of lying, fraud, theft, and contempt for the rule of law by the elite of America at the expense of the majority of the country's citizens. The rabble, finally roused. And if Hillary had been elected, that also would have been a demagogue carried to power as well. Marie... Now, Marie Hannon continues. She says, He was treated as legitimate by many who should have known better. Uh, what? No. Trump was not treated as legitimate. So, Marie Hennon's claim here is unambiguously false. He was treated with contempt and scorn, as he is now being treated 
even by you, Marie Hennon, and by the vast majority of the mainstream media before and to a substantial degree after his election to the position of president-elect. And that contempt and scorn is not reserved for the orange-haired rude man, it is showered onto all of us, the deplorables, who continue to enjoy being cartoonishly reduced to a narrow collection of stereotyped insults. We are racists, we're sexists, we're misogynists, we're bigots, and so on and so forth ad infinitum. It's pretty tiresome. And I'm genuinely surprised that somebody of the intellectual caliber of Marie Hennon continues to rely on such uninteresting and predictable slander. And for the unwashed masses who voted for Trump and then cheered him on, they mostly did not think that he was legitimate either. They knew that in electing him, they were voting into office a New York City real estate hustler, a sometimes boorish juggernaut of a personality who would serve the public as a Molotov cocktail thrown against the political and banking class whose contempt for the rule of law and open contempt for the tax-paying livestock, which is to say the voters, had become too much for those voters to bear. Hennon continues, saying, In providing a balanced approach, the media helped legitimize what he said. <laughs> we're, we're talking about Trump here, right? In providing a balanced approach, the media helped legitimize what he said. In whose fever-addled fantasy was the media coverage of the U.S. election balanced? The media helped legitimize what Donald Trump had to say? Uh, no. That is false. Please, Marie, Miss Hennon, try to be less stupid. I have seen you perform in the courtroom, so I know you are not as foolish as this. But Hennon also says, free speech does not mean equal airtime. Well, this is a non sequitur. Trump funded his own campaign, and he paid for his own airtime. In the channels of mainstream media, his airtime consisted of a partisan press universally cheering for Hillary and attacking the rude, orange-haired outsider. Heinen seems to be implying that some sort of journalistic integrity was being demonstrated. Some few alternative channels did give favorable coverage to Trump, but in what passes for the mainstream news reporting, the persistent narrative was pro-Hillary and anti-Trump, making a bad joke of any journalistic claims to integrity or so-called balance. Hennon's suggestion to the contrary is that sharp contrast to reality. But Hennon continues, You shouldn't need to go to a fact checker to know that Mexicans don't rape and kill, that black lives matter, that Hillary didn't start a war, or the birther movement. Well, it's true. Mexicans don't rape and kill. That's true. Yep. Except for when, like every other ethnicity, including mine, the occasions that they do. If one person from a group does a thing, do we say they all do that thing? Guilt by skin color? Maybe guilt by hairstyle? How about guilt by regional accent? I'm going to return to the necessary distinction between an individual and the demographic that individual falls within. Hillary doesn't get to be an individual because she's all women. Mexicans don't get to be individuals either because we all know that they don't rape and kill. This type of collectivist rhetoric is wearying to any person who sees past narrow stereotypes of identity politics, and I am genuinely surprised again to see an intellect of Heinen's caliber using this base tactic in her rhetoric. And Heinen says, There is no balance to be had here, just a resounding refute by those who had the floor. Um, now this is confusing to me. Who's she talking about? Well, well, let's ask ourselves, who had the floor? In the American system, Barack Obama had the floor. He was the president, the party of Obama, and Bill and Hillary Clinton. In the universities, the progressive bully mob has the floor, and they still have it. In the media, the whores, who will tell whatever story their political patrons feed them, they've had the floor for a long time. And Heinen is, I guess, correct when she says there's no balance to be had, just a resounding refute by those who had the floor. But the refute doesn't take the form of reason, evidence, or argument. It takes the form of a non-stop torrent of slander. Woman hater, rape apologist, bigot, racist, xenophobe, we're all, we know how, how that song goes. And not a re rational rebuttal or argument to be found anywhere. But I don't think that's what Heinen meant. She was talking about the refusal of the Trump electorate to listen to their betters, you know, the elite, the media. Well, Marie, 
That's what happens when you lie to and insult and demean people. They stop listening to you. And we must not forget that the rejection of a singularly corrupt and criminal politician is exactly the same as the rejection and the subjugation of all women. Women, join me! This is no time for retreat! Because Hillary, the criminal, the liar, and the friend to bankers, yeah, uh, she's all women, right? I would like to think that that's a lie too, Marie. The problem is that women keep wanting to claim Hillary as their very own avatar. So maybe Marie Hennon is right. And if she is, it's a deeply disturbing thought and a disgusting idea. Thank you for your kind attention, and have a lovely day.